everyone. Welcome to FortiNet's 40 Guard Lab series on the Cube. I'm your host, Lisa Martin. This episode is going to focus on the FortiNet second half 2022 40 Guard Labs threat report. One of our esteemed alumni is back to break this down. Derek Mankey, Chief Security Strategist and Global v VP of Threat Intelligence at FortiNet. Derek, it's great to see you. Hey Lisa, how are you? It's, it's uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. There's likewise, a lot to... likewise. Before we dive into today's discussion, just remind the audience a little bit about your background. Talk about Fortinet's 40 Guard Labs, what you guys do, and sort of the intent behind this threat research. Sure, so my background, I've been uh, about 20 years now at Fortinet. I have a threat research background, surprise myself. Uh, now I lead our global threat intelligence team, so we have over 500 researchers working around the globe, eight dedicated labs. Uh, we're processing 200 billion threat events per day. That number keeps climbing. It's a noisy space. So there, our job is to curate that intelligence. So we're making sense. We're separating the signal from the noise, um, You know, trying to make it actionable. And we do that through customer protection, of course, through our hundreds of thousands of customers worldwide in real time uh, to, to, to update against the latest and greatest threats, to, to reduce that attack surface, mitigate the risk, but we're also providing um, advice to strategic reports, such as the Global Threat Landscape Report, which we do uh, twice a year, where it's a lot more, you know, we have the fun job of breaking down six months worth of data. That's a lot of data, data considering we have 200 billion events a day. So we go through that, we curate it, we write mitigation advice, um, and we send that out to leaders, decision makers, to CISOs, global CISOs around the world as well, too. So it's, it's all part of that. And we're also doing... Um, we're not stopping there. We also take the intelligence further in terms of partnerships, private-private partnership, uh, private and public partnership. The whole idea is we know what the bad guys are up to, so we don't want to just be on the on our heels with the shields up the whole time. We want to make progress, right? So we're working in the industry to actually disrupt cybercrime as well. That that is so needed, disrupting cybercrime. I, I I'd have to think back to you said two hundred billion events a day when I was interviewing you years ago, and it was it was a smaller number. So the fact that it's increasing isn't surprising, but it's great to see what Forty Guard Labs is up to. And you know, I always find these conversations around the global threat intelligence, global threat landscape reports so fascinating. The landscape changes so dramatically in, within six months. So Derek, talk about in your opinion, what was your biggest takeaway or some of your biggest takeaways from this latest report for second half of 22? Yeah, so first of all, you're right, Lisa, the, the numbers do keep increasing. That's not a takeaway to me. I mean, that's almost a form, we can almost put a formula on that. That's just a result of the growing attack surface that we see. There's more, there's more IoT devices. We have operational technology. We have more um, uh, connectivity now with 5G, 6G on the horizon, of course. So that's going to continue. We're just simply going to be seeing more volume. but. To me, one of the biggest takeaways was actually not a volume problem. It, it's something of a phenomenon I'm calling advanced persistent cybercrime, and I'll explain that in a second. What we're actually seeing is a shift now in cybercrime, which is a majority 80% plus of attack activity, versus targeted nation state attacks that are going after critical infrastructure. The cybercrime uh, phenomenon now, they're shifting more to targeted attacks. So the volume is actually dropping, but they're going after now very large enterprise, telecommunication carrier, uh, MSSP providers are going after uh, operational technology as well in targeted attacks because they know that if they can monetize that with the you know proverbial bigger fish, they're going to make a bigger payday. And um, this is what we saw. And, and the number one takeaway was wiper malware. Um, this is a bad news story, unfortunately. Uh, so destructive malware is now being used by cyber criminals. This is something that in, in that 20% less of attacks we saw with nation state actors starting in Ukraine, well, we've seen uh, malware that's been uh, developed for uh, warfare purpose um, that is destructive in nature, has one target. But now that's being commoditized and it's being uh, put into attack kits and we're seeing hundreds of thousands of these detections worldwide. So the, the wiper malware, we only saw Lisa maybe one per year. At the, at, you know, that's how sophisticated it was in the past. We saw 16 new ones developed in 2022. We've even seen more in Q1 of this year. And um, that, and as I said, cyber criminals now are enterprising this. They're even creating open source code. This is something we observed in the report where this is now becoming uh, rolled out in toolkits and uh, readily available. I was reading um, the press release, Eric, and your blog and noticed that the, the increase in 
uh, wiper malware was up 53% just from Q3 to Q4 alone. Huge activity. Cybercrime as a service is unfortunately booming. Yes, exactly. I'm glad you mentioned the cybercrime as a service because this is an example of how the, of how they're leveraging uh, crime as a service because they're taking this and they're wrapping it, refactoring the code essentially because a weapon is a weapon. It depends how you use it. But now they're integrating it into their own services, their own toolkits as well. We've seen, of course, ransom as a service. So that's another thing we highlighted in the report. That is still uh, absolutely a problem. It's a high watermark. It's a constant wave that we're seeing with that because we have these business affiliates that are signing up to get commission. So if they infect a system and they get paid ransom, uh, then they will continue to do that. And we're we're still seeing that. But now with the wiper malware, it's a destructive threat. So they're starting to combine this into the ransom as a service model as well, too. It's the saber rattling, right? Saying, hey, we know we can hit a big system. We can take it offline. We can cause you uh, to, to bleed two, three million dollars in revenue a day. And so you better pay us up, up front, you know, a nominal fee and we'll give you your uh, your systems back. Right. And I was also look, noticing in the report that several new wipers were found in conjunction with the Russia-Ukraine war early in 2022, but spread to other countries, which was fueling that increase that we talked about. So it doesn't appear to be malware slowing down any time based on the activity and the volume. Organizations really need real-time threat intelligence across holistically across their entire landscape. Besides the increase in wiper, you mentioned ransomware. What else stood out to you? that was interesting or surprised you in the report? So I think this is like, so we talked about some of the bad news and uh, I completely agree now with the, the targeted attacks that are happening. It's one thing to deal with an attack if you stumble across it, but to be targeted in any sense of nature is a completely different ballgame. So I completely agree, real-time threat intelligence, having more, um, especially with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, again, 200 billion events, being able to deal with that and, and identify those tactics that are being used in targeted attacks uh, is key because the, the risk is just higher now, right? Um, we're not talking about uh, six-figure demands or payments. We're talking about eight-figure, not even seven-figure anymore. The damages are, are that big. Um, so that's the bad news, of course. The good news, though, is uh, we started to look at this from a different lens, and we looked at some. We we created a, a new view called the red zone. What that is is we looked at all the ways that these attackers are trying to get into systems. So if you look at the attack surface, it's very large. As I said, it keeps expanding and growing. There's about two hundred thousand holes in that attack surface. Those are vulnerabilities in the history of time, right? And that continues to snowball as new devices are integrated in, into the attack surface, IoT devices particularly, sensors and OT networks, all of that. But what we saw is, you know, that's a big number. You don't want to boil the ocean. From a CISO perspective, if you're trying to uh, mitigate that risk, how do you focus on the ones that matter to your organization? And so we started looking at that in the report and we created this red zone. So we said, okay, out of those, that entire attack surface of 200,000 attacks, what are the ones that are uh, currently actually open to organizations, right? So unpatched and open to organizations. And then what are the ones that attackers are actually trying to attack, right? So that's the red zone. And the good news is when we translated that, it was only 1% of that entire attack surface. The red zone, of course, because those are critical. It's active under attack. These are the ones that attackers are focusing on. So the good news is now we're not talking about 100% of this ocean. We're talking about 1% that we can really focus on and, and harden security and shore up the defenses. Okay, one of the other things I noticed was that even with all of the attention that Log4j has gotten in the past couple of years, there's organizations that are still not prepared to protect against it. Let's double click on Log4j findings, the tech sector, the most targeted industry followed by government and education. Organizations need to do some work here. This has been around for a while. Yeah, and so this th th this is something that we've in you know being twenty years at, at Forty Nine and following the threat landscape, um, it's not surprising to me, Lisa. And this is something I think we can learn from historical trends. Um, when we have a big, you know, uh, so it's not just Log Four J, by the way, but that is one of the most recent big ones that we saw. Even going back to WannaCry in 2017, um, you know, not Tatia was a big worm that spread on on that is called Eternal Blue, a big vulnerability. That was over five years ago now. In the report, it's still one of our number one uh, worms and destructive threats that we see. You know, five or six years old. Log4j now is just over a year old. 
But yes, it is still one of the most prevalent threats that we're seeing. So it's not just this one year window. In fact, we're seeing threats dating five, six years back. And that was another highlight from the report is that we're seeing code reuse now as well. So things that have been successful in the past, cyber criminals, they're enterprising, right? If they know that it was successful, they start to take that and tweak it and tune it into deploying new attacks. So adding, um, that's just a hole with Log4j. So now, hey, we can put ransomware or wiper malware combined onto that if we want to as well too. So again, the 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 story here is that unfortunately we're still seeing five five year old plus you know uh, threats that are still being uh, successful and in fact retrofitted, right? They're literally taking the code and they're adding new bolt-on uh, applications to it and deploying it. And uh, you know, this is something we really sounded the alarm on in the industry uh, a year ago, of course. I think every, everybody, uh, even my parents know about Log4j, um, but it, it's still something absolutely that is uh, one of the number one threats we highlighted in the report. Vintage threats are, are a yeah. thing. So yeah. with all of the, with the threat landscape being so amorphous, you talked about that the attack surface spreading and spreading and, and it's only going to continue. When you're in customer conversations, Derek, how do you advise CISOs to prioritize risk mitigation efforts so that they can minimize the attack surface as it continues to grow? Right, so so there's no, so this is a strategic approach. There's no silver bullet here. Um, thankfully, there are tools now. So number one, um, simplifying that attack surface, right? So starting with uh, tools and technology and, and security solutions, there's a big shift in the in industry now from uh, consolidation and convergence of networking and security. So that's the number one conversation uh, we're having with CISOs, right? And that I, I recommend is to reduce the complexity of your defense, right? Because if, uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago, it was very commonplace for organizations to have 15, 20, 25 vendors in a security stack. And that becomes very complicated to manage. You have more holes if it's if you know different appliances are misconfigured, and not updated with threat intelligence, and so forth. So, first of all, consolidate that. We're not saying go down to just one you know uh, security platform, but in general, um, you know the the advice is to go from that 10, 15 point solution approach to five, consolidate it down to five, then start to integrate and, and interoperate them through uh, through APIs, through SD WAN orchestration, SOAR. That's all a SOC conversation now too, right? Because there's a skills gap problem out there still, and we can't hire our way out of this problem. So these are tools that really help with that to orchestrate the uh, defense to have um, you know, SIM and SOC, so you know, event logs and then orchestration happening. So you don't have a human logging into a platform manually trying to change, you know, update policies. That's too slow. These attacks are happening really fast today. So, you know, uh, first of all, a tools and solution approach first. Uh, but then, as I said, that's not just the silver bullet. You have to think of this as an ecosystem also, um, as a supply chain, if you want. And humans are a big, very big part of that. So training and education is still a, a big part of this as well too. As I said, the targeted attacks, um, big conversation I'm having with CISOs now is deception technology, uh, recon anti-reconnaissance. Um, so knowing what do the bad guys know about you so that you can defend properly against that as well. Patch management, of course, we talk about that ZTNA, zero trust network access. It's all part of that defensive, proactive um, you know, stance. Then artificial intelligence and machine learning come in, you know, uh, to also, as I said, those 200 billion events. That's our job at FortiGuard Lab. So, so having, you know, real-time threat intelligence updated is important. And then lastly, um, you know, this isn't a one-shot thing. You can't just set and forget. Um, this is something uh, just like physical security needs to be looked at on a daily, uh, on, really on a daily basis, but refactor that. Right, so penetration testing, looking at what assets are your critical ones, are those secure? Running, uh, you know, uh, security audits against them is important, and then also having a playbook. Finally, um, it's not a matter of if, but when we say. So having a playbook ready, that when you are targeted and the attackers come knocking on your door, what is your incident response and readiness plan? There's, if you don't have an IR uh, forensics team in house, of course, have a trusted third party provider to help with that. Yeah, it, like you said, it's not it's not if anymore. It's when. It's probably how often. What's going to be the damage? So one thing I do want to understand is, is in our last few minutes, Derek, is what FortiGuard Labs is doing and the FortiNet technology. How can it help CISOs and other leaders address the cybersecurity talent shortage? I imagine looking at machine learning and automation is going to be critical 
for a holistic security strategy in, in that landscape? Very critical, absolutely. Um, and again, um, I, I think of this as a stack, right? So you have, I mentioned the, it really starts with automation first. So uh, again, technologies like SOAR and orchestration, SD-WAN, um, that takes a, care of a lot of the sort of mundane day-to-day -day things that you really don't need humans to be doing. Uh, then on top of that, yes, that's where machine learning, artificial intelligence comes in. Things like NDR, network detection response, where it's actually picking out those sort of zero day attacks, being able to deal with problems that it knows about the AI and ML systems, but if it doesn't have a solid solution to it, then escalate it to, um, you know, to the uh, human experts, right? So it's really a, a pyramid based approach, right? Where you have the humans on top, automation living on the bottom, then AI and ML in the middle, but it's, it's critical. You, with the amount of threats that we see out there today and the volume and the complexity, um, again, like I said, you can't hire your way out of the problem, even if you wanted to, because there is a skills gap. So it really is a balanced approach. Um, and uh, training is still important too for the, the security professionals that you do have. Um, I also mentioned the uh, the partnerships too, right? So that's another um, uh, aspect to having, who do you call, right? If, if you have a threat, so the human element, that's where, where the incident response comes in. Um, we have our analysts at FortiGuard Labs that, that you know, integrate and work with customers every day too. So this report, we've just dissected a little bit of this. I'm sure the audience is eager. Where can they go to find the report and really study it in depth to, to learn how to improve their security posture? Sure, so the report's posted on Fortinet.com. You can also find, uh, we have a blog released on it on blog.fortinet.com. Uh, it's under threat research. We have also regular updates on there for things that are breaking past this report. Because of course the report, it's a very comprehensive snapshot of six months, um, but threat landscape is living and breathing. So we're, we're uh, every day researching and posting alerts on there as well. Fascinating. And of course, there's no rest for the weary, Derek. You're already working on first half 2023, I imagine. Yes, absolutely. We are. Um, it's part of the, the data compilation process. So, uh, and, and by the way, as I said, uh, that trend is continuing. Like in Q1, we've already uh, uh, released uh, what we call threat signals from FortiGuard Labs on, on new wipers also that continue to be uh, deployed this year. Awesome, Derek, thank you so much for your time. This is this great series, FortiNet's FortiGuard Lab series on theCUBE. We appreciate your insights, breaking down some of the trends that you're seeing. And as always, we love having you as a guest on theCUBE. Derek, thank you. It's a pleasure, thanks Lisa, looking forward to next time. Looking forward to the next one. And stay tuned, this is the first in our series with FortiNet's FortiGuard Labs. I'm Lisa Martin, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.